kind of creepy. Yeah, hopefully it's really recording. <laughs> Welcome again to MakingComics.com, the podcast about making comics, in case it wasn't clear from the title of the podcast. This is Jason Brubaker again. I'll be your host. Just so you know a little bit about me, I work at DreamWorks Animation doing visual development during the day and at night. I work on my own graphic novels and talk to artists and then record them and then make podcasts out of it. <coughs> um, let me just interrupt this uh, podcast real quick. And just just so you know, this is an old school Making Comics podcast back when I did MakingComics.com. Since then, I have given the site away to Patrick Yurick. There's new podcasts on there by Adam Greenfield called Gutter Talk, and Comics Fuel is a new one that they're doing, and a lot of articles and blogs and that kind of stuff. But anyway, I've been slowly putting all these old Making Comics podcasts that I did onto my YouTube channel. So that's what this is. And so if you're wondering, wait, you still work at DreamWorks? No, no, that's this is back in 2012 when I recorded this. I was working at DreamWorks, and I did run and own makingcomics.com, but now things have changed. I've moved to Idaho. I am doing comics full-time now, but all this stuff is really still fun to listen to. It's all very relevant, and I think it can really open up a nice window for you of how to break into comics. Especially, this is an interesting conversation because Jeremy Barlow is talking with us. He He's a amazing writer. He's written Star Wars comics for a long time, worked at Dark Horse, and he's interested in making web comics. And we've been friends. He's been my editor for a long time. And so this was kind of a fun conversation because Jeremy's um, approaching this as if I were to get into web comics to try to do my own thing and not just get Dark Horse jobs, how would I approach this? It was a fun conversation and I hope you guys get something out of it. Anyway, back at it. All right, so yeah, I'm uh, Jeremy Barlow. I was I was an editor at Dark Horse for a number of years in the early aughts. Uh, worked on a lot of uh, big licenses like Star Wars, Indiana Jones, Conan. Um, left there a few years ago to write full time, and I'm still sort of involved in the Dark Horse family. I actually write Star Wars and Mass Effect and Death Clock, and you know whatever else they'll have me do. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much how I keep the lights on. Awesome. Sounds good. Well, thanks for being here. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having <laughs> Oh, and, and just so everyone knows, um, even though I just told you guys not to address the audience, um, <laughs> <laughs> but Travis, just so you know, yeah. um, Jerry and I, uh, way back in the day, we yeah. uh, went, you know, crashed at hotels to go to the Comic-Con back in, like, 1990. Four and Jeremy somehow hooked us up with really good hotels and um, you know this is when neither of us had any clue about comics and so so we have a you know yeah, a yeah. long past we, we go back yeah I remember that first <laughs> that's, year that's fine <laughs> yeah. well, I don't we, mind being so, the outsider <laughs> uh, <laughs> but right. the funny thing is the only time Jeremy and I talk to each other is once every you know for five minutes every Comic Con <laughs> you right. know I, I think that's how it is for all of us. Yeah, you know, I see you maybe what twice at a show, so you know. Yeah, yeah. So I guess it's the exact same thing. Dep- and it really <laughs> depends on the show. If you're going to San Diego and you're trying to uh, have a decent conversation for more than five minutes, you're you're at the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um. So so, uh, Travis, could you introduce yourself and yeah, talk about what you're working on? Uh, my name is Travis Hansen. And uh, I'm an art director for a firm, a mountain bike firm that's completely outside of comics. Uh, Felt that I needed to uh, totally expand my uh, artistic ability into other mediums as well. Sort of like don't have all your eggs in one basket. Uh, I'm a freelance illustrator as well. And I draw the Eisner-nominated Bean, a webcomic that has gone through several incarnations and has been... uh, uh, now in the way I, I wanted it, the way it should have been, it's in current incarnation now. Uh, I'm also a dad of five, so if you hear a noise from kids coming in and out, I apologize, but it's, it's just a big house. Thanks, you guys, for being here. Travis, I want to, um, I guess, first start with you because um, uh, when I first met you, 
I saw your your stuff at the Comic Con, and you were trying to pursue it as a as a not like a written novel, right? And um, I, I just think it's real interesting, like in talking to you, how uh, how a lot of these different approaches you tried was because of trying to like i mean a lot of different people gave you advice you need to do it this way you need to do it this way well i listened and, it was like and, oh, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. it was like listening to a bunch of out um different influences that i shouldn't have listened to in the beginning uh, i should have actually gone with my my gut feeling i mean years ago almost 12 years ago being actually was a web web comic online that oh really 12 years ago oh yeah it was oh, one wow. of the first and I just kept changing it and changing it, and then I went to a con and talked to several people, and the first thing they said, well, do it as a comic book, but do it uh, six by nine, you know, like a regular standard book. And I love landscape. I really just love that feel that uh, Bill Watterson really instilled in Calvin and Hobbes, and I wanted to emulate that kind of feel in my own stories, kind of a landscaped version where I didn't feel that I had to follow a horizontal uh, viewpoint. And so I listened to the one guy that said, hey, you know, do it as a, a six by nine comic and and work with several guys. That was my first mistake was having a team. Uh, because in as an independent or as a web comic, you know, most of it was you, you don't get paid for it. You, you just kind of do it and people will lose interest. And so that failed. And uh, I decided, well, someone said, well, write it as a novel. So we went and we wrote it as a novel. And uh, that struggled after the second novel was published. And it was one of those deals where I took a year off, felt really just frustrated of where I wanted to go. And, and something deep inside just said, why don't you go back and do it the way you originally visioned it? Start it as a webcomic again. Just put it back up there and be the only guy that works on it. And I started it, uh, you know, that was right probably after you and I met. I got back to the doing it as a, a webcomic the way it should have been and then took it to print from there. Uh, really glad that Dave Peterson kind of braved the way to go, hey, landscape books are okay through Mouse Guard. Mm, yeah. And followed that as my um, kind of guideline and then followed Jeff Smith's kind of mode of operation and – put being where it is and you know it was a struggle uh to get it out there to get the story that the way i wanted to do that i i mean i love don't get me wrong i i grew up reading marvel but uh my biggest influences were definitely the independents i love the uh ability that they had to just tell their stories the way they wanted to tell it and i kind of wanted to emulate that whole deal as i as I kind of pushed forward. It's interesting. I had no idea it even went through more versions oh, than what oh, yeah. I saw. And those that have been around from the very beginning, I still get grief. So, <laughs> And I, I fully <laughs> deserve it. <laughs> I admit it. Because they'd get to a point, That's they'd like, be in the story, and then all of a sudden they'd go, well, why are you stopping? Well, because I want to go back and redo it. And then you know, my wife would look at me like I was nuts. And, and I, I just, you know, in the end, I was never happy with it until now. And now I'm this is the way it's supposed to be. In fact, I'm in the middle of volume three right now, and I'm totally jazzed on its direction. Yeah. Well, good. Can you um, say, just say what the website is? Yeah, it's uh, beanleafpress.com. Beanleafpress.com. All right, good. Yeah, don't I'll Google, definitely put that in the show notes, don't, too. Don't so. Google Travis. You'll end up looking at a, a male model of underwear. Same. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you do that on the side? I, I wish I had that body. <laughs> Cool, cool. And then, um, so let's jump over to you, Jeremy. Yes, um, yeah. So, um, besides just doing um, awesome mainstream work, oh, thank you, uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> the other week, you sent me an email, and you were yeah. just like, you know what? I decided I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and um, I was just wondering if you could talk about that. And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because I thought it was real interesting, some of the things you were saying. Yeah, well, it's been an interesting transition. Before we get into that, though, I want to age myself a little bit. I was doing the math in my head on the, uh, on the 12 years of the Bean webcomic, and I was thinking, like, wow, I'm, what did he, he started in 1997, you know, like with, with dial -up. and then I realized, like, no, we're not in, you know, <laughs> my, my, my time travel math is horrible. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> yes. Uh, I, you know, and I don't know if that correlates to how long I've been freelance, you know, where I've completely lost track of even what day it is anymore. Uh, I'm losing track of what year it is. Yeah, I hear, yeah. I hear that happens as you get older. <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, so yeah, so, so regarding that email I sent you, um, a little bit of context. Uh, you know, like I said earlier, I've been involved in the industry for about 10 years now. I took, a, I took the job at Dark Horse in 2001. And uh, prior to that, I grew up loving comics like we all did. You know, I grew up reading Marvel and, and DC and Dark Horse and uh, actually wanted to be an artist in my teens. Uh, but I just didn't, I didn't put in the work, you know, I just thought I had all this, this just amazing natural talent that, you know, I don't need to bother with perspective and, and light sources and, you know, anatomy. I can just, I could just draw guys shooting lightning at each other and, you know, the opportunities will just come pouring in. <laughs> um, so fortunately I was, uh, I was living in Salt Lake City, uh, around when I was about 17, 18 years old. And they had a, there was a publisher there that accepted amateur submissions. They just published pure amateur comics, and a lot of them were terrible, but there was some good stuff in there. But I used to submit to those guys uh, fairly regularly, and I would get rejections from them, uh, which at the time I would get just all bent out of shape, uh, you know, because how, how could they reject me? How could they reject my awesome <laughs> lightning shooting superhero comics? <laughs> <laughs> um, but looking back now, they, uh, they, they were really great. They would send me these really like detailed critiques, like panel by panel describing, you know, the concept of camera angles and anatomy and all this stuff that I didn't feel like I needed to study. That's awesome. How often do you get that? Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I still have those, those handwritten letters. They were really, really amazing. Uh, but what kept coming up in those letters is that they really liked my writing and they really liked my, my my stories and my ideas and they kept encouraging me to to keep submitting so i took that as a sign of like okay well my talent obviously is is in this other area and i'm going to pursue it um and then i just uh i just went on to college and got an english degree and i and comics just kind of faded away for a while i just kind of decided that uh you know beings that i as i couldn't be an artist and i wasn't uh didn't have what it took to to do that full time that I had to look somewhere else. So uh, novels came up for a while and like everybody does in college, I thought I was going to write screenplays and I uh, got really annoyed with all those people in Starbucks with their laptops, all <laughs> deciding they were going to write screenplays. I wanted nothing to do with that. Um, so, uh, so I decided I was going to get into publishing somehow because I really liked the idea of helping other people achieve their visions. You know, I really like the idea of working with people on their stories and getting their books out. And right after I graduated from college, my wife and I moved out to Portland where Dark Horse Comics is and happened to apply when there was an opening in the editorial department. And the comics light bulb flickered above my head again. It's like, oh, okay, this is, you know, I still have this love and I'm still reading and now I have this opportunity to be a part of this world again. And my plan was to get into the company, uh, See how the see how the machine works, make some connections, maybe work for a couple of years, and then transition into writing full time. But the problem was, I really liked the job. I really liked putting comics together and working under deadline, and just feeling like, you know, it's feeling like you're in the trenches with with your colleagues, just being under that deadline gun all the time. And uh, I ended up staying there for quite a bit longer than I thought. Uh, until I decided that, you know, if I don't make a go at the writing, I'm never going to do it. And a dream is going to become a regret and, and all of that. So, uh, so over the course of these, these years that I was working on comics, uh, I got a really good look at the industry and the direct market. And I re it really became clear to me that it's, it, you know, it's just so, it's so insular and incestuous. And the, the, the companies, Marvel and DC, you know, they do good work, but they're really just aiming at this audience that's, that has grown up reading their stuff. They, they say that they're interested in appealing to a wider audience, and they're always chasing this elusive, you know, like the Spider-Man makes a bazillion dollars at the box office, and they seem to think that that should translate into comic sales, but, you know, movies and comics are completely different experiences. Not to mention that the people that see Spider-Man and then go down to the comic shop, if they can find one... Uh, they pick up a Spider-Man comic, and it's just—it's not at all what they what they expect it to be or what they want it to be, uh, you know. But for the longest time, I just thought, okay, well, this is the world that I exist in, you know, this this world of the direct market and these comic shops and this audience. 
And in order for me to survive, in order for me to be a success, I've got to appeal to this audience. You know, I've got to find a way to make myself appealing to Marvel or DC so that they'll hire me, uh, so that my profile can be raised, so then I can transition into doing the creator own stuff that I want to do and have an audience that'll follow over me or follow with me. Um, if that mm-hmm. if that makes any sense. Well, that makes yeah. perfect sense. Um, but you know what I what I what I came to realize is that. Uh, you know, as much as I love superheroes as a kid, I just don't have that fire. You know, like I, I there are a lot of other pros in Portland who are doing a lot of really great work, but I, I you know, I, I hang out with them and I go to lunch with them and uh, you know, go out for drinks and I hear them just talk about just in their free time how they're coming up with the, you know, they just fantasize about how great it would be to write the Fantastic Four and how they're pitching Fantastic Four stories or whatever all the time. And it's like, well, you know, in my free time, I'm trying to think of my own stuff. You know, like. I, I look at it like if I was given the opportunity, if I was invited to write a Fantastic Four story, I would come up with a good story. But it's not something that I, 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 I'm just driven to do on, on, on my own. And so I've, for the longest time, I was just really conflicted and feeling like a failure because I just, you know, I really feel like a lot of these, these comics that are made now by Marvel and DC that are produced by people who are fans first and professional second i don't mean that as a slight to a lot of people because like i said there's a lot of good work going on but clearly you know they're thinking in terms of like this is the continuity i read when i was a kid and there's these story holes that need to be filled and i want to be the guy that fills it i want to be the guy that explains why wonder man's costume changed in west coast avengers number 17 you know and uh (laughs) it's it's just i don't know mentality is just so foreign to me and I, i i just you know, so like I said in the email, I've just been feeling really bad about what I do because I've not been able to get any traction with these companies because I don't think I present myself in a way that just exudes that enthusiasm for Wonder Man's costume or, or whatever. And uh, at the same time, I knew web comics were growing, but I never, I never really paid attention to them because, to be honest, I hate reading comics on my computer. I hate sitting there with my mouse and you know clicking through the pages. It just does not feel natural to me it doesn't feel organic Uh and it wasn't until i bought an ipad a few months ago that uh, everything just changed it's just been like this confluence of events of getting this ipad and then seeing watching the remind blog and seeing how everything has come together with that and the fundraising and the audience that that you've built with that jason Mm -hmm. and uh, Mm -hmm. so so you know seeing this Seeing, I guess, the viability of of being able to sit on the couch with my iPad and read like Ethan Nicole's Bear Mageddon or or Rat Fist or uh, Doctor McNinja or any of these books out there, Bean Travis, I was reading on my couch earlier tonight, and uh, not only seeing that like you know this experience is just as meaningful as sitting down with a printed book, but that there's also this audience commenting and interacting and supporting this material that is so different than the guys who are out there reading superhero books and going on the internet and bitching about everything and talking. <laughs> oh, they, that's all it is. They just, just talk about how much they hate it. They buy it. <laughs> They'll go out and spend five on an X-Men comic and then immediately go to the internet and talk about how this X-Men comic has ruined the X-Men. Yeah, yeah. that... that... <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it's just been this double-edged sword of negativity between like the publishers yeah. wanting to do to do this kind of material and then the audience just like wanting to see it fail at every turn that i got i got to a point about a month ago or or so ago where i just was like i do i even want to do this you know like is is this something i'm even cut out to do because my motivation is you know i just want to share my work i just want to connect with other people through these stories that i want to tell but if these other people are just want to tear me down like i i you know it's just it immediately puts up this wall so so to to wrap things up this has become kind of a long ramble but so between getting the ipad and seeing uh you know, talking with you jason at comic con last year and seeing how uh, just how awesome it was for you to take those copies of remind around to people and how receptive everybody was you know like to, to be reminded that there's this audience out there that's just hungry for great work, you know, and hungry for sincerity and like pureness of intent. Uh, and, uh, you know, between that and there's some stuff going on with Marvel now, suing, counter suing the guy that created uh, Ghost Rider. And there's this fear now that people who go to Artist Alley and sketch corporate owned characters could be in some sort of legal trouble. Uh, and just realizing like those companies obviously are corporations that need to protect their 
their copyrights. And all that we're doing as freelancers that are doing work for hire are just serving this machine. You know, we, we try to do meaningful work, but we don't have any stake in it other than whatever emotional attachment we have to our childhoods at, at, at doing this. So, so seeing this world open up in front of me and seeing that all these stories that I want to tell that I was just thinking like, oh, I've got to package them for Image or Dark Horse in these 20-page chunks that are going to be appealing to the guys that run the comic shops who you have to convince them to order a copy of something, which means they won't order a copy of, of Justice League that month, you know, so you're fighting that fight. And, uh, you know, just seeing like, I can do a story that it doesn't matter what the page count is, it doesn't matter what the length is, I can just put it up a few times a week. And there are people out there that I can connect with and interact with. It's just like it's completely changed my my perspective. I'm I'm so energized and excited to to become a part of this world. It's it's you know to say it's changed my life might be a little melodramatic, but I really <laughs> don't feel like I feel like this this is actually like one of those mild posts. I'm going to look back on and go, oh, yeah, okay. Welcome yeah. to the dark side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can relate as far as like once I made that connection with the internet and switched over it it completely changed my life and it opened up so many different doors and it opened my eyes to so many other things you know that that it was good for that i didn't even understand it was good for so yeah i can relate yeah well and you know i have to say all this really quick too that i i have the benefit of uh having a wife who uh makes an adult wage you know she like yeah job <laughs> so that you know i had that gives me the flexibility to, to kind of chase this yeah. way that if i was just if i had to solely make my living doing comics i don't think i would have the opportunity you know i'd be chasing star yeah. jobs yeah. uh which i'm grateful for that i have but yeah i, I, I I'm, you know. gl- I'm glad to be the underdog there because uh, my wife is able to stay at home and i'm oh. able to cover that with my artwork mm-hmm. You know, but it, it comes down to really, honestly, how bad do you want it? And I and I think that if you want it bad enough, and I know Jason's in the same boat, and I guess you're going to see a lot of, um, you know, I, I look at web comics as independents, and they they have the same vibe of the '90s and the '80s of the '70s. The difference is, is the distribution models that were once there are no longer there. Uh, Diamond is very, um, we don't say nice things about them yeah. in public. You know, we, I mean, I would. I would love to to be with Diamond. Um, for me, it's that passion of, of you know everything you said of, of things that you like is why I actually do the being online. Mm-hmm. Uh, it created an audience that um, is bigger than probably any distribution I could have ever asked for, and right. it's worldwide. I've got fans in Japan and in Australia and in Germany and in Sweden and like Jason once I realized how the web worked and how I could utilize it to tell my stories the way that I wanted to tell them any length you know and, and I'm an epic writer so I like to be long anyways um, those doors kind of opened up and then those same fans though I've noticed are loyal to you you know they love the fact that you're willing to interact with them which adds a whole nother level of appreciation on their part right and then the other thing is is once they realize that you're publishing work and this is where i think it goes hand in hand where the web is a great tool to get your stuff out there but once they realize that there's a book that they can hold in their hands they go buy they actually will pick it up yeah. and my online sales are are do really well compared to being in a regular traditional store and as much as i would love to be in those stores um i see that business model changing incredibly in the next oh, couple yeah. of years oh yeah well if you if you had gone through comic shops, if you had just relied on the direct market and diamond to do, to to sell bean, you'd sell what like three, four, maybe five thousand copies if you're maybe. lucky. And that's hoping, and that's if you can sustain it too. I mean, yeah. a lot of independents don't realize that the way diamond works. And I can understand their business model is that you have to have. Um, I believe four thousand books. Well, that's a huge chunk of money to to print yourself Mm -hmm. and especially if you're trying to keep the book about 50 cents on your cost and you're trying to sell a a 24 page black and white for four bucks that's a hard sale for an independent 
And those, yeah. those doors are just not opened anymore. And then you want to have that second book, but you can't afford it because you've got to wait for the returns to come in on the first book. So the internet has created an opportunity for, and unfortunately, in the beginning, it was not the best art and the best stories. But now uh, some of the work out there is beyond phenomenal. Uh, there's some stories out there that are just heart wrenching and just gorgeously illustrated. And, yeah. and uh, you know, uh, if you get a chance, I would recommend looking at the Meek by uh, Dershang. And I and did see that. Yeah, that that is fantastic. That she is does really gorgeous good. work. Or Laxadaisy, who was also up for an Eisner last year. And you know, it's an interesting community as well. Mm-hmm. We're a lot more. I notice that sometimes, you know, on the outside of in the in the comic industry. At times, I would feel that there was a, a stronger competition to yes. kind of push people out. But yet within the webcomic community, it's more, how can I help you? You know, yes. What are you doing? Let me help you get out there. Let me help you get your story going or let me help you progress. And I love that about it. It's, it's yeah. just so positive. Yeah, that was that was the revelation for me is to just to see that 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 camaraderie and that sense of everybody wanting to see everybody else succeed. I, I mean, you're right. Definitely in in the mainstream American comics industry, there's there's a lot of great people, uh, but there is definitely a little bit of that, you know, a little bit of a cutthroat attitude and a little bit, you know, because there are only so many jobs at Marvel and DC, and everybody is competing for them, and so. There's a little bit of a sense of of some people looking over their shoulders, or some people not quite wanting to show all their cards because they don't want to reveal that you know oh I have this contact with this editor at DC, but I don't I you know I don't want everybody to have this contact because uh, yeah it seems to me like there's some insecurity in that as well. If you're so threatened by the idea that somebody you know might get an email address of somebody you're working for, and that would lead to you losing a job. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a weird environment to work in. But another thing that uh, I just thought of when you were talking about the audience is that what's occurred to me with this web audience is that they are loyal to you. You know, they're loyal to Travis, the creator, and what you've created. Whereas the Star Wars fans, who are who are generally really positive, I've been to some great Star Wars conventions, and everybody's just really happy to meet anybody involved with Star Wars. But they're loyal to the characters, and they're loyal to the world, and it doesn't matter. Almost doesn't matter who is making the product. You know what I mean? Like the yeah, people who, I understand that. The people who love Spider Man or the people who love Batman or Justice League or whatever, they may like a particular artist's or writer's take on that character, but ultimately their loyalty is to that character. And uh, it, it, to the point of where they become really protective and defensive and mean about that. And uh, pretty rarely I've seen that. I, I, I don't think I've ever seen that in the web comics world so far. But you know, the thing about web comics is, if you created the web co- web comic, you're, you created the world, you created the characters, so they're loyal to your characters yes. under your terms. Yes, you know what I'm saying. The way you created them. But you have yeah. to be careful too. I mean, our fans are are wonderfully loyal, and I I love my fans dearly, mm-hmm. and I, I enjoy talking to them. But I'll I will definitely be honest that the fact that if you um, you know, they realize that they're getting a service for free for the most part. You know, they're getting a story that they don't have to pay for, and they appreciate that. But they also expect you to live your word. If you say mm. you're going to update three days a week, right? you got to have a – and for the most part, they can be understanding. Oh, he missed a week. I understand. But when it becomes consistent or when yeah. it becomes, you know, the minute oh, I'm no longer updating because I want to rework. And I learned this in the very beginning, you know, with, with being – it had a beautiful audience when I started it. But then I let all these outward influences kind of affect me, and I got to redo it and redo it. And being my harsh critic that I am over my own work, mm-hmm. um, I it took me a while to get some of those fans back, and it was hard being at a con and having to explain why I wasn't doing it the way it originally was, mm-hmm. and. And now that they know that it's dedicated, I, I'm really not going back. I'm almost – I'm inking page 400 right now, and I'm not going back to redo it. There is just no way in Hades, but mm-hmm. it's that same deal is, is they expect that. They expect me to be on time. They expect mm-hmm. me to, to give the service that I am. But in return, um, 
they're more willing to support the Kickstarter project to get the funding. They're more willing to buy at the show. They're more willing to spread it through their friends, through their comics and such. And that's kind of like key. It's learning the importance of your fan and learning to communicate with them. You don't have to be buddy-buddy. Sure. But you have to be civil enough and, and kind of play and, and, and toy and stuff like that. And they love it. Oh, we have, mm-hmm. I, I have so much fun with the fans of The Bean that I actually look forward to going to shows just to get a chance to see a face to a, a guy that has been leaving comments for the last mm-hmm. you know yeah. a year and a half. You yeah, know, and, yeah, and some of those people, you know, you end up creating some really good friendships, and and uh, you know, I, we've come up to the deal where we were at a show in Tucson or something, and and they said, yeah, if you ever come out, you know, this way again, you can stay with us. Oh wow! Yeah. You know, I'm like, okay, you know, yeah. it, it, but it didn't feel creepy. Yeah, <laughs> you get to their house. There's a little shrine built to now, you. Now, now there, that's when I start to worry. You know, that, and that's why I never go to cons alone. You always bring like one or two wingmen just to be. <laughs> but yeah. but yeah, it, it's learning to to appreciate your audience and let them appreciate you, and at the same time, be dedicated to them. And and that's hard for a lot of creators because you know in in the creation of web comics, a lot of guys have that second job or that third job, sure. and they're they're trying to make life work, and they wanted and they have a great idea, but unfortunately life gets in the way for them, and and because your audience doesn't happen overnight, and I know that that happened with Jason as well. It took mm-hmm. you know the audience that we both have now took. We're about the same age in our comic now, aren't yeah. we? About two and a half yeah. years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was about exactly. two and a half years of growth of of right. us pushing and talking and and dedication to updating, and our numbers actually show that mm-hmm. um, because of that dedication. Yeah. yeah. Well, what I respond to, I, and I think probably what you're talking about with your audience responding to is that, uh, and I mentioned this before, that sincerity of intent. You know that that you guys are doing what you what you're doing because you because you have to because you want to you know you're not I don't sense any kind of cynicism from either of you in terms of like well I'm just doing this because I want to get a movie deal you know or I'm just doing this because I think it's it's what sells and is what's going to make me famous yeah um, exactly you know and and uh, as a reader that's that's really what I'm drawn to you know that's re- I I I think the people who approach it for the movie deal mm-hmm. are are always going to just be so frustrated that yeah like to the point of giving up yeah because it's like you have to love what you're trying to say and what you're doing and your art and your story so much that that it can pull you through the times when you want to give up yeah on it on it you know yeah. and if you if, if you're doing it just for that movie deal there's so many discouraging moments on that path mm-hmm. that that you'll give up because the you know the movie deal is just too it's too far off yeah you know it's just too hard to you know put the enough pieces together to make that work i mean and i'm not saying people can't do it you know people write scripts and sell them all the time oh sure for a buck but um you know that's just a, a day job then you know it's just a freelance job at yeah. that point yeah um yeah well yeah and it just comes down to the motivation of are you doing this because you want to tell stories and and speak to people or are you doing this because you want to sign autographs you know <laughs> I want that movie deal. <laughs> so what I'm curious about, uh, you know, and, and I, I'm coming at this from a different angle in that I'm just purely a writer, you know, like I'm not able yeah. to illustrate these stories. And, uh, you know, fortunately, I've, I have found someone here. Uh, I'm part of a studio, a Periscope Studio, that's a collective of other comics professionals. And uh, one of my studio, studio mates, Ben Bates, who draws a lot of stuff for Archie, he's doing the, the new Crusaders book that is sort of their big push right now but you know he and I are teaming up on this this web comic and one of the things we've been trying to figure out is how far ahead to work so that you can maintain your twice or, or three times a week schedule you know like how many pages to stockpile before mm-hmm. we start rolling things out you know and is it a good idea to do 15 or 20 pages right at the start you know and have a big chunk of material that that people know oh, that you just post all at once right and then I I I I would say I'm against that idea just okay. because you need to give yourself time. Like it takes time to build that audience. So if you roll out 15 pages, you, you, you you're 15 pages you, in the hole. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and one post isn't going to build your audience. So, right. so if you can, you know, 
post a, a, a page and then have a blog post in between. Or, mm. You know, I don't know. Like, it, like the more frequently you can do it, whatever it is, okay. The the more it gives people a chance to come back and remember to subscribe to the RSS and share it mm -hmm. and share the new page. And you know, it, it what it is is it's getting. The thing about web comics that books don't give you, mm -hmm. even though I love publishing my books, is a web comic um, allows people to be involved in your story and in the story for for a year or two of their lives okay. every week. There's no you know shelf life. It's it's, it's yeah. Constant. They're not going to pick it up. They're not picking it up off the shelf, reading it once, and then putting it back and okay. never thinking about it again. They're thinking about it weekly uh -huh. because they're coming back to it weekly. And they're thinking, I wonder what's going to happen next. And, oh, let's see, I forget how this, you know, happened. So I'm going to go back and read this again, you know. And so it's, it's that's the coolest thing about it, in yeah. my opinion, is, yeah. is people, like, if someone's in high school and they start reading your webcomic from the start, uh -huh. it's like they're going to grow up then into adulthood with your comic right. on their mind. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Right. So and that's that, a that, wild experience too. When you're at a con and someone said, I've been reading this for about five years now and, and they love it. And they're just, because not only, you know, to piggyback on Jason, not only are they, you know, experiencing it, they're experiencing the actually developing the story with mm. it. Mm -hmm. And a web comic really, if you look at it, has the same kind of feel or formula as a 1940s serial in a newspaper. Okay, that right. came out yeah. once a week, and it was usually sometimes in full color or you know or black and white. Buck Rogers and Tarzan and, and Flash Gordon, mm -hmm. and it was always what's happening next week to be mm -hmm. continued. And so you're hooking them constantly to to come back. You give them a reason to keep visiting you. While if you just unleash 15 pages, well, they've read the 15 pages, and it might be a month and a half before you update again. Well, there's mm -hmm. no reason for them to come back to your site on a daily basis to see right, what else right. you're doing. Right. Or they might be discouraged next time they come back because you only have one page. You know? uh, I the, see. The, the okay. thing about the frequency of your updates is you're also training your audience when to expect things from you and okay. how much. So it, it, it can be whatever you want it to be. It could be once a month. It can be once every day. Mm -hmm. But whatever you start, like you know, Daniel Liske, he did it once a year. Yeah. You know, it's like whatever you train your audience to do is what they will expect yeah, of yeah. you specifically. So. So I guess yeah well I mean I guess that makes sense it sounds like that you're making a promise it sounds like you are you, you know your first gesture is to say this is this is who we are this is what we're about and this is what you can expect um and then and just the, staying true to that and for the first couple of months you're going to be slow I mean mm -hmm. and that's just naturally how it is but as it grows your audience grows with it and that's yeah. what gets exciting um you know, rule of thumb for me is is uh, years ago, years when I got started in, in trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be another Calvin and Hobbes, you know, another mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bill Waterston. And uh, what's required by Universal and, and all the Tribune syndicates was six weeks mm -hmm. of, of stories that were ready to go. You always had to be six weeks ahead. Oh, okay. And, and I treat the bean very much the same. Where even though I have an ending to my story, which will be way off whenever mm -hmm. I get it done, but I look at it as what I'm working on tonight is literally almost – I'm a little bit even further. I'm about two months ahead. Oh, okay. okay. So they're getting stuff that I worked on way back when and – Believe you me, the temptation there is to go. Oh, I'm dying to show this page. I'm dying. <laughs> you know that yeah. that's kind of like a, a drug for you. You're like, oh, I want I want you to see yeah. what I'm working on. Yeah. But at the same time, you realize that that they're to them seeing that one page that just updated yesterday was like that's brand new to them. They're right. They're just as excited and and they want to talk about it. Now the problem for me is I kind of forget what I was writing back <laughs> then cuz I'm moving forward so I got to go back into that mainframe of oh you're asking about so and so. Okay, well let's talk about so and so. Yeah, yeah. I can relate to that. I mean, I've done some I, I for the last couple of years I've been writing these all ages Star Wars digests, which have been great. They they're really uh you know, I sell them at conventions, and kids come up and buy them, and they go nuts for them. And and I hear from parents saying that uh, you know I have my I couldn't get my child to read, and they're really resistant. And I gave them one of these books, and they just devoured it. And, 
Um, but the thing with those are they're, they're 80 pages and I write the script and I, I send it in and then Dark Horse hires an artist and I don't see it again usually. I mean, the editors are good at showing me pages as we go along if I ask, but generally I don't see the book again until it's published, uh, which oftentimes can be up to a year later, you know? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, by the time it rolls around and I start getting emails and interacting with people, they're like, oh, I loved that Boba Fett book you wrote. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah. I guess I did, didn't I? I great. Yeah. <laughs> but but you know, yeah. you know, the other cool thing, though, um, and this is kind of an enticement to those that support being financially, mm-hmm. is when I publish a book, um, I publish it in, in basically a series of four chapters. Each pe- chapter is 40 pages long. So a printed book is 170 pages. Okay. And I throw in a little extra. And right now, volume three is technically going up online for people to read. The first two volumes have been printed. But when it goes to print, they get everything in advance. Mm, right. so, so they get to jump ahead before anybody else. And most of them, in fact, in fact, I haven't had anybody yet spoil it for anybody else. Oh, interesting. Which is really cool. Like, it's a whole different kind of fan base. And, uh, you know, it just gives them a reason to, to support, you know, oh, you know, I want it a little bit earlier. I want to know what's going on. And then they're, they're more excited for the print copy just as much as they are for the, the web copy. The web copy. Yeah, that, so, was, well, that was, well, that was really striking to me watching Remind Volume 1 come together. Uh, because I, I, I just remember thinking to myself sometimes, like, yeah, you know, Jason, you're just, you're just giving this stuff away, you know? Like, you're putting these <laughs> yeah. pages up online. Yeah, you and everyone else was thinking that. <laughs> yeah, I was, because I understand it. <laughs> yeah, well, I understand it now, definitely. But I just, yeah. I, you know, I, I didn't understand the, the, the philosophy and the mechanics of that, because I just thought, you know, by the time the book actually comes out, you know, it, the people have already read it. You know, like, what, yeah, why, why, why would they buy it? Right, yeah, exactly. Right. Right. Well, and then I I actually saw the book and was like, oh, okay, this is gorgeous. Well, and they want it too. I mean, if you look, uh, Order of the Stick, which is just a bunch of stick figures on. um, (laughs) This this again. (laughs) Yeah. But but he's a pioneer in webcomics. You got to, and his audience is is probably 10, 12 years worth. So Uh it makes sense. You know, you have 12,000 people that, that, have been following him and this is kind of what Jason was saying where the people keep coming back and giving them the reason to come back they supported him with probably what 1.25 million dollars that goes so he can print yeah. a book yeah. that just goes to show anyone can you know draw stick figures put it online for 12 years uh-huh. and then you could get a million dollars I mean it's just yeah, that right. easy it's right, easy, right? <laughs> but you gotta last that 12 years you know some of those yeah yeah <laughs> Well, you know, and the thing is, no. you know, in, in, in fairness, I, you know, Order of the Stick, I'd never heard of until all this, this Kickstarter stuff yeah, started. Me neither. Kind of, but, you know, I looked into it a little bit, and the reason that people love it is because he speaks to that audience. You know, he's, he's talking their language, and he's saying something that they want to hear. And it might look like crude stick figures, but to the people that are into it, it really means something. Oh, it, they connect you know? to it. Right, right. And so... I mean, look at the at the comic conventions. You know, it's not just superheroes anymore, mm-hmm. and and you have huge audiences of steampunk, and you have huge mm-hmm. audiences of, um, you know, what's coming out in the movie and fantasy, and and the bringing back of Tolkien's work through uh, uh, mm-hmm. the movies and such. Whether people like it or not, they still want to dress up as those characters, and they still right. want to be part of it. Right. And it's just showing that that the audience is is no longer at a comic convention solely, um, you know, Superman yeah. and, and right, right, you know, an eighty year old Wonder Woman walking by in a costume she shouldn't <laughs> be wearing or, or, or such. It's 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 really huge, and and part of that influence I think has been because of what the web is able to offer and show yeah. people that there is more out there than just yeah. Superman, and Batman. Who I love, I love both of those. Oh guys. sure, <laughs> yeah. No, we both do. And I think, I think the trap that is easy to fall into is not separating superheroes from comics. You know, <laughs> that a comic convention isn't a superhero convention. Even exactly. though that's, that's the engine that's sort of driving the, uh, the mainstream now. It's, they're not the same things. Not, not pursuing it as a, as a hobby. 
is has been my key. Mm-hmm. Yes. You know? Because if you do it as a hobby, you you aren't going to stick with your updates. Right. You it, it's it, too many web comics come out and then they go, "This is what I want to do because it's just fun for me to do this. I just want to do it and just enjoy myself and draw and and everyone will love it." You know, but they don't take it seriously. And so then, you know, when when something happens and they go, oh, well, this is just my hobby. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll get to it later. You know, it's just like it, it just collapses. Everything keeps falling apart because they don't come through with things and they're not taking it seriously. Well, yeah. And, you know, you have to realize that it's work, you know, it is. As, as gratifying as it is. It's yeah. I mean, it's just as hard work as, as as anything else. And I think that it's when you're starting out, it's easy. It, it was definitely true for me when we would go to those Comic Cons in the early days. And I just had this fantasy of like, oh, you know, I'm I'm going to write comics. It's going to be great. I just have to sit around and think of stuff and write it down. And, you know, and then actually getting into the nuts and bolts of it. It's like, no, OK, this is, you know, it, in, in some ways it's very, it's mathematic. You know, it's problem solving. It's, it's sitting down and thinking about this is the story that I want to tell. But how am I going to do it? How am I going to execute it in a way that's that's thrilling and meaningful? And, uh, you know, and it's I, I really think that what separates people who succeed from those who don't a big part of it is the people who who succeed just don't give up you know they they power through those times when it gets really exactly. difficult and i mean i think that could answer the reason uh, order a stick is where it's at you know i mean that that guy updated a comic before comics were popular mm-hmm. you know web comics i mean mm-hmm. For for years, and it was about sticks, and he loves it, and right. you know what I'm saying. And the audience right. just kept growing, and you know, and he even said like, "Hey, there was a lot of times I thought about giving up on this, you know, but I'm glad I didn't now, you know." <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and and you know, the sad thing about, I mean, and it is a trap that I think we face as webcomic creators is we get used to wanting that instant gratification that someone that a reader saw something that they liked and they want to comment, and then we realize and we think. Well, I didn't get any comments on this page today. No one's reading my comic. What did I do wrong? And they don't understand the fact that people are reading mm-hmm. um, and that your audience takes time to develop. And you might post something that day that really just no one wants to, to say anything back mm-hmm. about. And so it's also learning to separate that little narcissistic feeling that we create about ourselves going, oh, I hope someone comments so I can mm-hmm. comment back and realizing that they don't have to. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing is is learning, you know, how to read the tracking software that's out there that allows you to go, you know, I'm more interested. Uh, it drives me nuts when someone goes, well, I had three million page views. Well, to mm-hmm. me, page views mean nothing. Mm-hmm. A page view is the fact that that guy's mom could be there clicking through all <laughs> 700 of his pages, uh-huh. you know, over and over again each day. Well, you know, that adds up. If you've got 700 pages of comic you're going to have a lot of page views. It's that unique viewer that mm-hmm. comes back that you want to track, that you want to know who's there. And you know, when Bean started, I can remember that first month. Uh, and Jason, and I talked about this a little a couple of days ago. Mm-hmm. Having only for the whole month of March, I had 1,500 unique people. Mm, okay. And it was really tiny. You know, that's every oh. day uh, a unique a unique individual is someone that comes from a computer once. Okay. And if they log back on, it tracks them as as if it's in their cookies, it'll probably mm-hmm. count them again, but for the most part, it, it's just that one person. So 1500 mm-hmm. is not a lot of people because you could have had that same person coming back each day. Mm-hmm. But now, two and a half years later, that number is is those uniques are huge. And and that's what you need to watch. And then you go that kind of gets me through think think of that feeling of no one's reading my story no one's commenting no one's not but when i look at the the uniques that are stopping by i realize that's really not the case they keep coming back they keep getting bigger so the story must be doing something right yeah do you when i started remind sorry jeremy no go ahead i i had like for the first three months i had like i think it was under 50 unique viewers a day mm-hmm. and, and i that's... just remember thinking <laughs> how much longer can i keep posting these pages and not <laughs> and <laughs> before i get 100 people a day right, you know right. like it was just like i gotta get 100 you know and um now it's you know it's more than that but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it just it takes a lot of commitment yeah. and you gotta you really psych yourself out like after three months and there's still a little a little trickle of people you, 
you're going to question what you're doing and the amount of time you're putting into it, you yeah. know? Yeah. And so that's when the rubber meets the road and you really start going, okay, why am I doing this? Is it doing, am I doing this to be uber popular and make tons of money mm-hmm. or because I want to tell this story right. and eventually get it out there into a lot of hands, you know? Yeah. Well, it, it <clears> seems <throat> like with those unique views, uh, you know, I've, I've often wondered if that, uh, it, people that comment on the internet seem to just sort of represent a minority, either a positive or a negative minority. Yeah, and, and this is true of me. Like, I checked out Bean, and I read Bear Mageddon and, uh, and Meek, and I'm, I, you know, I go back to those sites often, you know, as often as, as there are updates or as often as I remember, but I don't leave comments, you know, just I really enjoy the stories, and I really look forward to meeting these people at conventions and interacting with them personally, but it doesn't really occur to me to sit down and write a comment. And often because I'm on my iPad, you know, and the, the keyboard on that is a little bit awkward and uh, I would take a little bit more effort. But, you know, you have to think that there are probably a lot of people out there that genuinely love what you're doing but just don't feel the need to, to, exactly. to vocalize that. I wouldn't be surprised if it's like one out of every 100 people mm-hmm. comment, mm-hmm. you know. I it, wouldn't it, be surprised that. if it's 1%, right. yeah. Right. Exactly. It's, I mean, it's. Because yeah, I don't comment hardly ever on yeah. anybody else's blog, yeah. but I, you know, I read a handful of comics. So Unless you know, I and maybe smart hockey or something, then well, I'll comment back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I comment on my own blog a lot. <laughs> so is well, it? You is have it? To. That's important. <laughs> because does it become a trap for you guys then? To do you ever feel tempted to chase that one percent? You know, those people that are commenting, and you know, I, I oh yeah, you guys yeah. probably you, don't change you know the, your intent and what you're doing with your story based on the comments of those those people but uh you know does it does it become it, a temptation to it definitely affects things because i mean you know if someone comes and comments and get, leaves you something negative um it's going to affect you and it's you know you you got to decide how you're going to react to that kind of thing you know you know because you just can't do what the minority says to do and and they're hiding behind you know. anonymous too at many times and you, yeah. you really yeah, don't the, especially the people the negative people yeah. but yeah but a lot of people come to my play my blog and i say i encourage people to 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 <laughs> fix my grammar and all that <laughs> stuff because i know i just i'm just terrible at it and and usually it's like really late when I, and i just tweak the text the night before and yeah. i'm like okay th- i think this will work i'm glad yeah. i'm not and the then, only one <laughs> <laughs> and you know like you were saying travis like you put you give your books into to the to your audience who buys it uh, before the web comic people can see it mm-hmm. but uh, i said that really yeah, but I, I go but, through like four or five editors before i get to that process <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was I was gonna say like I've got I've kind of fallen in love with this idea of putting my stuff out there, warts and all, mm-hmm. and saying you guys can help me fix this. Yeah. And people really, really, really love that. Nice. And because then when they when they make a suggestion and I take it and I and I apply it to the page, mm-hmm. I think people feel like they are so much more a part of my book oh, than sure. than anything else. And it, it's. Part of it's laziness too, because you know I still haven't sent you all the files, Jeremy. Even though I told you I was going to send them to you uh, like three months ago. Yeah. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Part of it's because I keep changing my mind yeah. on you know the the the, the dialogue text constantly changes. So. Oh sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, so, and I can understand. I mean, the hesitancy you probably part of that is because you know once you send it to me and I do my thing on it, and send it back. It's that's the beginning, the process of nailing it down. You know, that's that's yeah. the permanence. Uh, I, yeah. and, and that's why I actually print is so I won't go back. Mm-hmm. The print forces me to, to me, the print is the end result. You know, I, I love printed books. Oh, yeah. And I look at that book as, as, it's the end result. And because it's the end result, I can't go back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because it's, it's, now it's set in stone. Well, it's on the internet, I can go back and change anything I want. I can instantly change that text up there and, and stuff. And, and so that's kind of why I print. It, it'll, it makes it go, Trav, you can't go back. You got to keep going forward. You got to keep pushing forward. And it's and if the art suffers in the middle of it in a certain point, just suck it up and move on. And you know, it, it, coming from a, a, a fan base of, of loving the old newspapers, as I go back and read some of the older comics and, and follow them, I can see how that artist grew over the years. And in the very beginning, the fans they loved you then. They love you as you progress, and they don't even realize that your art might have been horrible in the very beginning. Mm-hmm. 
they don't even see that. They just see the progression of the characters and, and, and such. And, uh, you know, we were talking about fan interaction. Uh, one of the cool things that, that I have done in the past is if I build a rapport with someone that, that likes to comment and, uh, I will actually create a figure of them and put them in a, like a group scene or something where they're wandering oh, okay. in the background. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And and they kind of get an idea that, hey, that's me. All of a sudden, I'm now in his world. Yeah. Yeah. And they eat that up. And people eat that up, not just yeah. them. You know, They just love that connection of, of wow, you know, they value what I say. Uh-huh. They joke around with me. They treat me like I'm anybody else. Uh-huh. And yet he was cool enough to hide me in the background somewhere, uh-huh. and I don't even tell him I do it. I just right. say, "Oh, you know," and they go, "Who's that?" And you know, well, you know, it looks familiar because I just <laughs> go off different posts or whatever. And yeah, and and it's stuff like that that I think the web allows you to do. It allows yeah. you to really play with your fans and interconnect with them. Whereas yeah. uh, going the publishing route and being published as well, I d- you, I don't have that. I don't yeah. have that same connection as I do with with the internet. Yeah, that reminds me of Ethan Nicole. How a month ago or so he announced the bear matures mm-hmm. or something. I was thinking mm-hmm. that same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Where you can get mauled by a bear in his yeah. comic. Yeah, and um, I guess he just sold out of them in like a day. He's yeah. like, I've been able to pay my rent for three months. Uh, Thanks, guys. <laughs> and, and and stuff like that is just so cool. And yeah. you know, even with the way Kickstarter is, it just allows you to have that interaction that. Before you just couldn't, and people, um, you know, I, I've been lucky enough. I've had, I had uh, the first book I was able to fund in three months, really quickly, and it was because of um, Jason that kind of finally kicked me into going into Kickstarter. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I that kept, took a lot of uh, a lot of coursing. <laughs> yeah, I, I kept kicking myself. I was just not listening. Yeah, and, and, I remember leaving a comment going. Okay, so explain to me again why you're not going to do Kickstarter. <laughs> I wasn't really sure, you know. It's just that because fear. you were talking about all these other options. And now now you know? I love it. Three months yeah. later, I funded a second one. Oh, so yeah. I yeah. funded right after it, and now I've got the same people that funded going. When's number three coming? We want to mm-hmm. fund number three. Can you? And I'm not ready yet. I like to have all the pages drawn so then I don't feel extra <laughs> pressure. Right. But. Right, yeah. You know, it's that they just love it. They want to be a part. They want to support and just hold on. Mm-hmm. Just to throw this out there, I think that's one of the keys to a successful Kickstarter campaign for a comic is having your comic done oh, or very yeah. close to done. Oh, yeah. Because too many people go, fund my project, and me and this artist are going to make this great comic, yeah. and and it's awesome. I'm telling you, it's going to be so good. We have the most unique way of telling stories. Oh. You know, it's like nobody pledges. Well, it's right. because people don't. Yeah, you got to trust people on there. It's all about that whole system is built on trust. Right. right. You know, you're you're pledging to someone, and they don't really need to, you know, send you something. <laughs> right. No, there's no there's no actual security involved. There know? is none. Yeah. So um, you, you really have to build people's trust, and so having something finished. I mean, if anyone wants Kickstarter hints, that would be my biggest one. I think I'm actually doing a panel up at uh, Emerald City on that. Oh, cool! Wow. Hey, you should. Can I come in that panel too? Uh, I think I can sneak you, and I got to send something up. So. Sweet, because I would love to do a panel at some point in my career. Yeah, <laughs> panels are cool. They they help sell uh, books. Um, okay. <laughs> cool. I want to be in it. But one of the the, the other thing, <laughs> I'll hook you up. Don't worry. I gotta I gotta clear it with uh with them, but I think it should be cool. Um, but one of the other things is is they also see your work ethic. Mm-hmm. And and that's important too. Is 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 they want to people want to support someone that's actually going to do what they say, and if you've got it all done and they've seen that you've been regular on your updates or yeah. at least honest with them, they are way more willing to. People are more willing to support and pledge and and mm-hmm. help you progress. And a lot of I think that's a, a, a misconception that a lot of creators think that they they go well I can't get published outside of you know, in the regular realm through one of the right. big companies. I'm just going to do a web comic. Right. And then they they don't realize the amount of work that goes into that as well. You know, mm-hmm. you not only have to, you know, you put your web comic up there, but now all of a sudden you're in charge of advertising and you're mm-hmm. in charge of this and that. And you realize it's like, holy crap, there's a lot more work than I thought. And right. I'm just right. going to quit or give up or move on. Right. So I have a, a Kickstarter question. Uh, yeah. 
seeing Order of the Stick and uh, what was the uh, what was the video game thing that it was just a double double fine double fine right so you know this is clearly getting some attention about the just amount of money that Kickstarter can generate. Uh, how do you guys feel about? I, I noticed that uh, you know there's some people who have books with Image. You know they've they've got publishing agreements with Image Comics who are now trying to do a Kickstarter campaign to pay themselves to make the book, like you were saying. Or, you know, I wouldn't be surprised now to see some of these bigger publishers start coming in and seeing, like, oh, there's ID- money here. IDW did one. Mm. And I, I have, to be personally honest with you, I, I have an issue, I think, with the bigger companies coming mm-hmm. in. I mean, if you've got a publishing contract with Image or something, uh, let Image take care of yeah. you the way Image says that they're going to take care of you. Um and and but yet if if you're also though if you let's say you have a book going through Image well that's great but you want to do your own mm-hmm. and you don't have Image publishing it then go do it run through right. Kickstarter use your fans yeah. but but the thing thing about Image though is is you still have to pay to print the book and you you pay a that is, a, a flat fee well, so is, you, you have do have to come up with that money don't they have a program that's if I remember right or where they would take an independent and cover the cost. What? I guess, and it comes out of the back end or yeah, something. Yeah, I don't really understand how Image is, is structured entirely. And, and different there are different kind of sub-publishers under the Image umbrella that, that have got different arrangements. I mean, I guess my, my sort of where I was going with that question is it seems like anytime you have a situation where there's a lot of money pouring in, you're going to start getting people who are just chasing that money. You know, who oh, aren't, definitely. Who are, Anywhere you go, you'll get and that. I'm just wondering if, if there's any concern about how that's going to affect... Well, I think I think it's obvious to play to pledgers mm-hmm. because it, you you know you see something like Order of the Stick come out, and then you see a whole handful. If you go and search through that thing, mm-hmm. a whole handful of like just ridiculous projects where yeah. people are just it, it's just some crazy dream, and they don't they haven't put a foot in front of the other to yeah. get it started, but they launch this campaign with this ridiculous goal because they think, oh well, Order of the Stick did it, or so and so did it. Oh sure, and so you know. Um, I mean, unless you really want whatever book that this corporation is mm-hmm. putting out to work, um, I, I think that would work. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they'll obviously get funded. And I've seen a couple publishing companies, you know, like one um, brought over some Japanese animation or, or I mean, manga, mm-hmm. manga, I don't know mm-hmm. how you pronounce it, Ma- um, yeah. and republished it, you know, in American in English <laughs> and <laughs> in America and you know they raised like 12,000 or something like right. that and they're doing it with another one now and you know it's like but I think their fans uh, are I supporting guess, that too yeah the the fans like there's a ri- you know the original artist you know which people want to see it translated and so so that kind of makes sense but you know then you start seeing you start really I mean when I look at these um, projects it to me it just like it's obvious if someone's just trying to make money or if someone is really passionate about the project and the thing that really defines it, the difference is do you have your personal project finished mm-hmm. have you been slaving away at it for years mm-hmm. yes well then you know you're passionate about it right, right. <laughs> you know if you just have this pipe dream and you you have this hefty goal and nothing to show for it right. then you're just in for it the money or, because i if if any one of those projects got funded there's no way those people i mean mm-hmm. I'm, i guess i shouldn't say no way but it would be so hard for those people to follow through and finish yeah. that book yeah. because you have the big chunk of money right now mm-hmm. and you know like you can divide it up over the course of a year and pay yourself to to do it but it's just it's already done. Mm-hmm. You've already mm-hmm. spent your money. Right. You know right. what I'm saying? And, and so you got to motivate yourself then to finish the book after you've already made all the money you potentially are going to make on right. it. And I think right. also going into it, one of the things that, that makes Kickstarter that people can actually see through is how realistically how realistic you are on what your needs are mm-hmm. and being open about it. And You will have definitely creators of all walks in life, especially now seeing what Order of the Stick did, go, oh, that's my easy ticket to make a million bucks. Right, that was my concern, right. But yet at the same time, I think the Kickstarter audience that is there, they're very much aware, um, you know, what makes a successful project fund is not, uh, it's your audience. It's, Mm -hmm. It's your personal fan base that creates your Kickstarter project. And it's your personal fan base that actually gets it pushed. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these creators don't realize that. And so when I did mine, 
I was very honest. And the first thing I said was, I can throw in a certain amount of money too. I'm not asking for you to pay for everything. I want to help pay for my own project because I just like doing that. And if we overfund, great. But that's not what I want. I wanted to to make exactly what I needed. And we actually overfunded, which was awesome because it ended up paying for shipping, which was a huge Ah. chunk of money. But... uh, (laughs) Thing, I didn't factor shipping in at all, and it <laughs> yeah, and it got wow. expensive. Yeah, shipping for us was like almost fifteen hundred dollars. Wow, and but the thing is, is is I think they see that, and those guys that that want it for all the money, if they've only got fifty friends that are going to donate, those projects die out really quick, yeah. And, yeah, and, exactly. and they don't succeed. But and you can you can look at the projects like the Double Find the video game, and those guys didn't don't have a video game made yet. Right. But the thing that they have is a giant track record right. of years and years right. and years and years of working in the gaming industry, right. defining the gaming industry. Right. You know that niche that mm-hmm. they're working in, and it's just like who else would you want to pledge your money to right. to to make this kind of game? Yeah. Right. You know? Right. So right. so if if um. You know, Todd McFarlane shows up and launches a Kickstarter mm-hmm. it's fund. to fund his new book uh-huh. that he hasn't even laid a finger on. Right. Yes, it will fund because he has a he has an audience. He's, right. he, he's defined the co- comics in the nineties. Right. You know. Right. So, but if somebody else shows up and says, "Hey, I could do stick figures playing D and D," yeah, I can draw just like Todd McFarlane yeah. or stick figures. Yeah. And I'm my goal is a million dollars, right? And and <laughs> their and their web comic, you know, and this is kind of where it comes into of understanding how the audience works and building your time and waiting for your audience to grow so that you can fund these projects is is like crucial to the whole the whole key of of what makes those projects successful. And and honestly, I mean, I might know only, th- and this is kind of how I figured out my audience was I only knew about thirty percent of the people that actually funded my Kickstarter project. Okay. And that was cool. But the rest were fans. And most of them wrote to me afterwards in and out. Oh, yeah, you know, I've been following Bean for years. And I've been, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, if they want to do it, great. I don't care. I just know that in the end, they're probably not going to get funded. You know, if, if, they're, if their intentions are really, you know, uh, what was it? Was it in Shrek where the donkey said, not pure? You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like the Kickstarter audience is is much more democratic, you know, that, that like you said, they're going to see through that, that, that insincerity and that, that, that impurity of intent. Yeah. And, uh, and not buy it. Yeah. That's right. Making comics. Dot com. That was the first half of that was the first half of the conversation with these guys. Um, there's a lot more meat in the second half, and so please uh, check back. Uh, hopefully within a week, and I should have it up by then, as, uh, assuming I can get it all edited and uh, and uh, uploaded. All right. Until then, see you guys. Hey everyone, Adam Greenfield here, host of the Making Comics Gutter Talk podcast. Now I know you're a fan of Jason Brubaker and his work because you're hearing my voice on his podcast. And because of this, if you're not familiar with us, I have a sneaky suspicion you dig Gutter Talk too. So check us out twice a month on Fridays as we check in with comic creators of all levels and backgrounds to discuss the technical and personal about being a comic creator. Gutter Talk alumni include Stephen Bissett, Mark Wade, Lucy Bellwood, Dean Haspiel, Paolo Rivera, and many, many more. And that's not even counting the live Gutter Talk panels at Comic-Con and WonderCon. So head on over to iTunes or whatever podcast subscription tool you use and subscribe to Making Comics Gutter Talk. And be good to people, people.